David was a kind, thoughtful, inquisitive person who enjoyed spending time with friends and traveling. He devoured books, kept up on world politics as well as domestic, and had a wonderful sense of humor, which you've all experienced. <clears throat> he was also a passionate champion of the world peace. Um, the images that I have uh, selected aimed at showing you these qualities, but let's begin the story at the beginning, right here. David was born in New York City in 1947 to Martha and Alfred Fishman. Although he was very nearsighted from an early age, in fact, he often said he was born with thick glasses. <laughs> he developed his love of reading early and excelled in school. He went through the usual Jewish rites of passage um, with his parents as an only child. He attended the Phoenix and Ethical Culture School um, on a scholarship for his high school years. Fieldston established in New York in 1878. David went on to MIT for graduate work in political science and Soviet studies, but found that it wasn't what he was looking for. After working at various government jobs in D.C., he pursued a law degree from the University of San Francisco while working at the same time. He graduated in 1979 uh, and passed the bar exam in 1980. He practiced labor law representing management for government agencies and later went into private practice representing plaintiffs and unions. And here are David's cousins, Phyllis in the black jacket um, and Paul in the blue shirt, who David and I visited in Florida several years ago. They'll be sharing their memories of David, um, their cousin, very shortly. While David was doing his legal practice, he still managed to have some fun, uh, traveling to Key West, um, going to many parties, having many girlfriends, and ski club activities, which uh, Cliff will be talking about fairly soon, um, as will Marsha very soon, both very uh, old friends of David's. David and I met on a hatch run around 1992. For those of you who don't know what a hash is, it's not something you smoke. It's a foreign service running phenomenon that started by the British long ago and was soon embraced by other overseas staff uh, from other countries. After our two-year engagement, we were married in 1996, first by a justice of the peace. David was a lawyer after all. <laughs> and then by our friend, Tony Guida, who had the authority to conduct weddings and he conducted lots of them at the Renaissance Fair. Hence the strange garb and the leery <laughs> look that he has. Uh, he handed out signs and had t-shirts that said, go and give sin some more. So this was a, an appropriate way to have our, our small wedding ceremony. Um, and that's my mother on the left. From his early days in D.C. Through, throughout his life, wine tasting was one of David's favorite pastimes. We enjoyed wine wherever we traveled, particularly when we shared it with friends. Gourmet picnics with friends at Wolf Trap were another favorite pastime, and wine was definitely on the menu. David enjoyed hiking, and we did a lot of hiking when we traveled, and with the local Monday and Friday hiking groups. Here, David is flapping his wings, trying to encourage the bird perched on the left to get him away. He did mention his sense of humor. More hiking with friends in West Virginia, in Michigan, and the race for the cure with our late friend Susan Weaver and her late husband. The other thing that David really, really loved was dipping <laughs> in all bodies of water. I have hundreds of pictures of David dipping every place we went. <laughs> and one of his favorite spots was Cliff and Wanda's Pond. Um, where he liked to sit on the on the dock. And every January 1st, Cliff and Wanda, brave souls that they are, would do the polar bear plunge. And occasionally they they roped some other friends in to do it. Not my thing. 
<laughs> then there's David's duck humor. David had this habit of making quacking sounds during our group hikes uh, to drive some of the hikers crazy. And um, they uh, led friends to give him rough duckies and other duck items. If you go into the library a little bit later, I've put some mementos of David out, and you'll notice the duck theme is also represented there. So uh, wherever we went that there was a duck opportunity, I took duck pictures of him. Tropes. Travel is another passion of David's and mine. Our first big trip was a Nile cruise. We also visited friends Linnell and Dennis when they were just renovating their house in Sancerre. And then we went back again a few years later when it was quite fixed up and there was a, a wonderful wine museum there. We went on a wonderful trip to China with a large group of friends um, organized through a, a, a Chinese person that, that the friends had met through Friendship Force in Thailand. And there's David ringing the bell. He jumped up there and was the first volunteer. And the Great Wall, of course. We also visited uh, friends Ed and Sharon uh, and went sailing with their friend Buddy in the in the British Virgin Islands, which was absolutely gorgeous. And we went to Italy with um, friends Joni and Tom and a larger group of friends. And then we went off on our own to um, to see various cities in in Italy, including Padua, where we visited um, Albanian friends Silva and Benny. Benny is there showing David the centuries-old medical school where he teaches. <laughs> then we went to Mexico. I had a conference, and of course there's David in water again, in a cenote, yet another type of body of water to swim in. Well, but when you're a duck, you have to be in there. <laughs> and then, uh, our first friendship force trip was Chile, which uh, uh, was organized by Barbara Williams over there. And uh, we did a, a wine tasting trip and uh, did some hiking in the Andes as well. And then afterwards, everybody went their own way. Barbara led a trip um, and we headed south and along on the Pan Am Highway. This is just gathering with some of the friends in Chile. And that's a volcanic tube. And of course, wine tasting. Uh, we went to Vietnam. I was doing some work there for the World Bank and David joined me in between assignments. And we had some lovely trips on the river and a wonderful Hollow Bay tour. When I was taking photos, David would read. He read continuously. Even when he was listening to lectures, he read. <laughs> we went to Australia with Friendship Force and had a wonderful time. Uh, Susan, our friends Susan and Howard were on that journey. And then we went off to Tasmania and met some Friendship Force people there and hiked down um, a very large mountain. And there's David pointing to one of the Tasmanian devils and a woman who led us all around. Um, then <laughs> with Susan and Howard, we went on an adventure in Dubai on the way home. And one of the things was a desert trip where we had a whirling dervish and uh, we had the opportunity to see what it feels like to wear that type of clothing. <laughs> We visited friends Helen and Joan in, um, in their wonderful cottage in Nova Scotia with a beach nearby. And we went to Russia with uh, Sharon Tennyson, who has worked with Russia for a long time, very concerned about US-Russia relations as, as was David. And uh, we did a tour around to the various cities where the businessmen had been partnered with Rotarians so that they could learn as they moved into a capitalist system how to operate in the capitalist system. So we went to some sites like Catherine's Palace, and we also visited a number of factories. And this is the Dutch of David intensely talking about the Ukrainian situation um, with some of the Russian friends there. 
uh, we went then to Estonia and visited friendship horse friend Cooley, who uh, showed us all around. That's Cooley with her very tall son and David on the right. And on the left, she took us to a friend's dacha, and the friend immediately brought out her dancing costume so that we could see what the traditional dance costume looked like. We went to Costa Rica. There's David in the water again. <laughs> you know, wind, waves didn't stop him. We went to New Zealand. Um, on another friendship horse trip, the men in the left, in case you're wondering what's wrong with them, um, they are trying to look like the, the, the Maori warriors, the stance that you've seen in some of the movies from the football players do that with the tongue out. And we also went to Hobbiton um, because that was what we wanted to do so we could see how hobbits live. We, after that, uh, after two home visits, we, we went on a wonderful tour in the South Island. That's Queensland. Um, and we went, we saw glaciers, we took train rides. It was really lovely. David really wanted to go to India. And so off we went to India on another Friendship Force tour. And we went a little early so that we could go to Bollywood. I dragged him to the slums of Mumbai and he dragged me to Bollywood. <laughs> and David plunged right in um, in all of the rituals and intense conversations with people. And then, of course, humans. <laughs> that's our host. And then the Taj Mahal. Then we took a, a journey to Brazil and went a bit early and met some friends. Friendship Force friends to go to Iguazu Falls. This is the Friendship Force group at the beach we were in, Fortaleza, which is very conveniently located with lots of gorgeous beaches. And that's David, who was one of the volunteers to jump in the water and hold flags up. It's something they do with every group that comes. Somebody holds up every flag that's represented on a global journey. We went to Germany, and that was an important trip because um, after the, that, that's our host and her uh, son and his partner. Um, after that, David went to uh, an international rotary conference in Hamburg while I went off to another friendship force um, journey in Kiel. And he made connections with lots of Rotarians there. And then we reconnected and went to travel one day. We also traveled um, on a wonderful road trip with our friends Emily and Al. That's, uh, I think that's a cowboy hall of fame there that David's leaning on the saddle. And David had bragging rights. He, he used his bragging rights for that mountain. We didn't climb, we were driven up there, but we didn't, we weren't puffing and panting at 14,000 feet, so he was pretty proud. <laughs> then we went to Australia, our last trip. Um, and we went early and went to the Great Barrier Reef and did a fantastic helicopter ride, and that teeny little helicopter, and also visited all sorts of wonderful sites in, um, in Australia on the Sunshine Coast. Then COVID hit, and so we were supposed to be also seeing Sydney, but the journey was cut short, and so we waited until our plane flight was due home and, and headed home. We had one day in Sydney, and we did get to cross the bridge. You can see the uh, Sydney Opera House behind there. And this was David's birthday celebration, which we held. Oops, we held in um, a Russian restaurant, Marivana in downtown DC. And then David was active in the ABA International um, Law. This was a partnership. This was the leadership meeting yeah. in Santa Rosa. And the, conveniently, the organizer of it happened to own a winery. And so they had, um, they hosted everyone at this gorgeous winery to have a lovely meal and, and sample their wines as the sun set. We visited um, David's ABA American Bar Association friend and his, and his wife, Elaine, in Brooklyn. And he attended some uh, and attended another um, ABA conference there. And wherever we went, David managed to have discussions about peace. He's talking with 
the keynote speaker at the Friendship Force Conference in 2019 in Boulder there. And on the other side, while we are having dinner, he's out having a conference call with someone talking about peace. David uh, became very active in first in the Alexandria Rotary Club and then in the um, the Washington DC Rotary Club and both clubs recognized his leadership in peace, which he was very proud of. And when he was diagnosed, he decided it was time to put our diagnosed with the pancreatic cancer. He decided it was time to put our money where his mouth had been. And so we made a donation um, to promote a collaboration between Rotary and the Carter School, which uh, is now moving ahead thanks to the help of many Rotary friends and Carter School friends. Um, and thank you all who have made donations to the fund for this. The first conference David was able to attend in November. We had another one in April. And sadly, um, we lost him to pancreatic cancer. Uh, we funded a report which has been issued and I promised David that I would see through his vision so that it would become a reality and become his legacy. And I wanted to thank all of you also who sent caring messages to him, which I read. And I know that those messages really helped him pass in peace, knowing that he was loved, respected, and would have a lasting legacy. Thank you very much. How many of you felt like we went through the last few years, few decades with them? It was really, you know, it really went through. The, the themes are pretty obvious. We'll come back on it, but they definitely include a relationship that I think we should both be very proud of with each other. The, so there are several people that have been lined up to speak, and the first one is, is Paul Plum of Blue Shirt fame. Uh, you saw him, I don't know him, but I saw him as you did. In an early slide, this is David's cousin who's going to be zooming in from Florida. Paul, are you there? Uh, what, the, what I'd like to talk about basically is something that most of you would not be aware of, and that's David's childhood. Uh, I was 10 years old when David was born, and uh, our families remained very close. David was an only child. And as a child, he had some childhood illnesses. He was at celiac and there were other difficulties. And he had difficulty relating to other people because he was not ex exposed to that. But when he was with us, it was always a wonderful time. And as he grew into his earlier child, later childhood years, we always visited back and forth and found him to be constantly questioning, always looking for new, th new ideas and asking and learning. And those were traits that David kept out through most of his life. He was a lonely child in a way, and he looked for friends. And I went, as he attended school, he began to find more and more friends. He became involved in many issues. And one of the things that I always found fascinating was at one point he became very involved with Nathaniel Brandon and Anne Rand and the idea of objectivism which is something that I think later on he would have shied away from. But he showed dedication to the cause when he got involved. And part of what I learned about David early on was when he undertook something, he undertook it with 100% of effort. He never could do something halfway. It had to be done to the fullest and the best of his ability. As he grew into adulthood, we became even closer although we saw each other less frequently. We would meet in Washington. We went on Long Island. He would come to our home in the Berkshires. And we did keep in touch and we continued our ideas and sharing of ideas. One of the things I found in David always was a questioning attitude. He took nothing for granted. And as he grew further, that developed even more. Once he met Mary, uh, there was another person. It, Mary brought out a new part of David, a social grace that he had never shown before. And the two together made for a wonderful couple. 
Unfortunately, the amount of time we shared was not that great because they were very busy, as you saw from the slides, constantly moving. We also traveled extensively and we rarely found time to get together. But when we did, there was always a wonderful time. We shared thoughts, memories, and ideas. And to me, David always represented someone who gave 100% to whatever he thought of, worked hard at achieving what his goals were, and when he did something, he did it well. I will miss the contacts I had with him, and as I know you will too, but David leaves us with many, many wonderful memories, and they are the memories that we will carry for the rest of our lives. And we're glad to be a part of this, this night, very beautiful tribute. Thanks so much, Paul. So we stay in the family for a little bit and turn to Phyllis Decatur, also a cousin of David's, and also on Zoom. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Phyllis. I assume you can hear me and see me. Um, I am David's cousin also, and I'm gonna talk about him a little bit differently than Paul did. I'm gonna talk him from a, a more personal viewpoint. As Paul said, our families were very close and we got together over the years for many events. And one of the important events was Thanksgiving. Uh, we shared a grandmother and her birthday was Thanksgiving. To this day, I don't know what the actual date was because we always celebrated it on Thanksgiving. So it was the end of November. And we would get together. At first, my parents hosted it. And then when I was married and moved out to Long Island, we went all the way out to Suffolk County to celebrate. And David and his parents would come out there. Now, David was living in various places but he always managed to get up to Westchester to pick up his parents, drive them all the way out to Long Island, which as everyone knows, especially on Thanksgiving is not a pleasant trip, but he never failed to do it and bring them back afterwards because family was very important to him. As a matter of fact, whenever he called us, he always said, hi, this is cousin David. He always introduced himself as cousin David being a part of the family was very important. And then of course, as Paul said, he met Mary and they became a family unto themselves and with all of the people that they embraced and embraced them. And that was the best thing that ever happened to David. It enriched his life so. And they had, as you saw, and as you all know personally, what a wonderful life together. And I thank you, Mary, for bringing such joy into David's life. And I will always miss Cousin David and always think of him as Cousin David. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, the next speaker is actually a, uh, a friend of David for many years. I don't know if we're going to hear about the parties, about the array of girlfriends, or what we're going to hear. <laughs> what we're going to hear from Cliff Beasley. Actually, we can bring the, the, would you like the microphone where you are? Yeah, I've got a Okay. David and I were good, close friends uh, for many years. And I'm missing. Yeah. I first met David in a land seminar and in a ski club. Where we really became, got to know each other, become good friends, was on a ski trip to Mount St. Anne, Canada, which is in Quebec. We were roommates. And uh, <clears throat> besides drinking a lot of good wine together, <laughs> and we both had a taste for that, uh, we, we enjoyed good life. We were both single at that time. And uh, he spoke French, and so did I, because we went into Quebec City. That helped a lot because they, they spoke French. There. <laughs> David had a natural ability for language. He, he taught himself uh, Russian and was able to do that. That's not easy. I, I don't speak Russian. All I know is Nyet and Dostoevsky. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 
I remember when he met started dating his wife, and I was very happy for that. It changed it put them, and, and they, they were very, very happy. They've been very happy together. Uh, one of the things he, she's, Mary said was that David loves to swim, and we have a pond that doesn't close that you can swim in. It's fresh water. Oh, you're the pond. And <laughs> they, they, I did not go in on these. <laughs> David and my wife, Yolanda, would go regularly, and the neighbors would come over to take pictures and things. And I would make blue lines for everybody. Hot blue line, uh, which is a spear that despite hot wine. And uh, that was sort of an event. We, and on more than one occasion, they had to break the ice to go into the pond. So I mean, that's, that's why I didn't go. Anyway, uh, David and I became good friends. I, uh, when I was at the military academy, I was I was able to take Russian because I had I had a year BMI first, and I'd use the same textbook for American history, so I was able to take Russian history instead of American history, and uh, that helped converse with David when he got really into Russian. I knew who some of these people were that he was talking about, and the history I knew who Ivan the Terrible was. Uh, more recent people, you know, Molotov, Vera, uh, like anyway, uh, they, David was very much into it. Uh, his, his project to help the Russians with their legal system was great. And I met his good friend Sasha, who, uh, who was very close. Uh, I miss him because we did a lot of things together. So I drink good wine. <laughs> David, David would sweat to each other. David would often come over to our house on the weekends if he liked it. The, the, my, pool, my pond didn't close, and he liked the cold water. Uh, and we always, they bought wine. We had wine there. And uh, I miss it. When he, in the end, David, Died with dignity in the past, and I miss him. Thank you very much. Wine and cold water seem to be making you turn. <laughs> Is there a march of gold in that? Yeah. Right. Very nice. But I stand up. I think. Whatever you uh, want. Uh, there we are. So, David. Uh, Fishman was one of my oldest friends. We met on the Chesapeake on a singles on sailboats cruise. And when I was in Baltimore in 1985, we were a couple for about eight months. And though we weren't after that, we did become close friends. I was fortunate enough to meet David's mom and uh, also his cousins. David and in a way made my life, introducing me to Washington wine and cheese and many of the close friends I have today. When he met Mary, he said she was special. And then Mary also became a close friend. Indeed, she, I, and several others here were part of a small girl <laughs> night out group that met monthly. David always called us the common, <laughs> and he enjoyed teasing <laughs> us. As others have said, David had a, lo a, lo a lonely childhood, but he became a warm and generous person who always had a smile and a friendly hello. His early career was a struggle when his love of international relations at Hopkins Face the cold reality of science-based political science at MIT. So after dropping out of that program, he moved to California, as others have said, and ultimately got a, a law degree and then came here. But David's love was always with international issues. 
And he, as you heard, he was an avid reader. Uh, but he devoted a year to learning Russian so he could attempt to bridge legal issues internationally. I felt like he returned to his roots. Regrettably, um, Russian politics shifted and David, when he talked, or, you know, at later years, always felt a sadness mm -hmm. for the lost opportunities, especially after Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But with Rotary and the Carter Center, David saw a related opportunity and pursued it over his final years and days and beyond, with Mary supporting him all the way, both in that and everything else he did. As Mary said, David had a quirky sense of humor, as all who knew him appreciated. He would bring the rat pack to Halloween at Washington Wine and Cheese as a basket full of rats. <laughs> and could be counted on to quack and make duck jokes. <laughs> when he and our friend Steve Arecchio went skiing in Europe with the ski club and I couldn't go, they brought me back a lovely cowbell I still cherish. <laughs> Always an optimist, David was excited about the opportunities ahead. He and Mary enjoyed many friends. And though time was not enough, as you heard, they got to travel all over the world with friendship for us, David and Mary's work, and with each other. When I heard David had cancer and it didn't look good, I, and I assume many others, felt like we had been sucker punched. Uh, I'll miss David's calls, usually late at night, to catch up. And unfortunately, I had the knowledge I thought would always be that David would be part of my life and all of the life of our friends at the Washington Wine and Cheese, the hiking group, and everywhere else. But David enjoyed life, appreciated his friends, and really loved Mary. The, the next tribute says, since our first meeting on April 30th, 1991, you've been an important part of my life, and for that I will always be grateful. <laughs> I've always considered you my American godfather. As my first host in the USA, you helped me tremendously to discover and understand your great country. You introduced me to so many interesting and important people. I'm thinking of the extraordinary life you've lived, your wonderful Mary, and the times we have shared. Besides you and Mary's hospitable houses, we've met at our house in, in our dacha in Moscow, at Harvard, Ithaca, New York, and Philadelphia. My students at the High School of Economics were so impressed with your lecture. I wish we could have had more time together, but I want you to know that I cherish the times we had. I wish, I'm sorry, uh, I hold so many memories we've made together close to my heart. I don't want to say goodbye, but I do want to say thank you for everything. And I want you to know that I will miss you very much. The, the next speaker is going to be Larissa Rasakova. Rasa Kazova, sorry, uh, David's friend of many years, who also participated in the Soros program. Uh, and David visited her family in St. Petersburg. She's going to be zooming in from Portland. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes. Please. And, uh, thank you so much for, so much for having me. Uh, my name is Lorita, and, um, and uh, David never called me Lorita. He always called me Lara because of his favorite character for Dr. Zhivago novel by <clears throat> Boris Pasternak. Actually, nobody called me Lara except my family members, but David, in a way, was my family. Um, we first met in 1989 in August, and um, that was very interesting time. Um, at the time, I was a trial attorney in St. Petersburg, Russia, in Leningrad, 
and David was um, practicing a training in Washington, D.C., if I'm not mistaken. One month prior to his visit, I was actually chosen to participate in the first very unique program, which was um, Russian Lawyers Exchange Program. It was initiated by American Bar Association and sponsored by Soros, George Soros Foundation. Um, David came to St. Petersburg to meet with me and he got my contact information from the program director, Stephen Reichen. So he called my law office in Leningrad and um, we actually met. It was very interesting and he was very enthusiastic about uh, um, Russian law and Russian legal system and everything. Um, later, I came to the United States to participate in this program and I spent nine months in uh, Washington, D.C. and the state of Hawaii. All this time, we, st we stayed in very close contact with David. He called me and we were involved in different projects and so on. I later decided to get enrolled in law school and David actually was laughing and joking about that, saying that, oh my gosh, you're an eternal student. You never work, you always go to school. So we laughed about that, but nonetheless, I graduated from law school in the United States and um, Law school actually was a very hardship, a big hardship for me um, because I missed my family and um, I didn't have much money. I didn't even have work authorization uh, to work in the United States to support myself. Um, do you hear me? Yes, we do. We hear you. Just... Sorry for interruption. So anyway, um, David supported me emotionally, and what I remember the most was our wonderful trip on Potomac River because he was a good sailor and he sailed the boat. So we went sailing, and it was very refreshing and very inspiring. What I also remember is David's enthusiasm about building the rule of law in Russia. And his enthusiasm was so contagious that um, all the people around him, you know, became very in inspired by his ideas and his enthusiasm. As already been mentioned here, he was um, multiple, he had very many interests and hobbies in life. For instance, once he and Mary came to visit us in Portland, Oregon, and we went dancing. He liked that very much and he was actually a very good dancer. I always will remember David. He was a big part of my life. And he also introduced me to the United States um, in a way. He was very enthusiastic. He was a very beautiful person who supported me and suggested that even during the hardest time of my life, I keep everything in perspective. And all the troubles and problems in my life will be just a little footnote in a big book of life. I will always be grateful for that words of David. And um, thank you so much for your friendship, David. I will always remember you. And thank you for making me a part of this tribute. Thank you. Uh, next is, is Scott Shostak, another friend of David's from the ABA International Law Committee. Scott's going to be Zooming in from Brooklyn. Both an honor as well as a very heartfelt presentation discussion that I'd have. I like to think of it more as a discussion when I'm talking about David, because that's what we did most. And the discussions ranged well over a decade. A little bit of background on myself, 
I am also an attorney and I am one of the vice, actually one of the co-chairs of the Eurasia Committee. And David's been such an important part. The Eurasia Committee is a subcommittee of the International Law Section. And that is part of the American Bar Association. It's part of a very big association that within the different levels of it, you're able to find something that means something to you and share that in a way that David was able to do that disarmed some of the hostility that we see today. And even in 2011, when David and I were early members of the Bar Association, early members of the, what was then the Russia Committee. And to see the way that things grew, I mean, most of us know in 2014, there was an issue, we're very well aware of the invasion in Ukraine. And many of our friends were on both sides of that borderline. And you watched as the Eurasia Committee, which was then the Russia Committee, became the Russia slash Eurasia Committee. And then it became the Eurasia slash Russia Committee. And in 2022, it became just the Eurasia Committee. David was able to navigate that because of it, both his deep understanding, his value of hurt people to people, the whole concept of the rotary, he's really, really involved in making that connection. And at this point in time, more than ever in relations in the world, and we can speak of the US-Russian relations, it's the people to people. It's the people like Vlad, it's people like Mr. Buryulian, so many people who Dave and I met with in Russia, who we know to be very good people. And were we to sit here, many of the problems we have right now would seem so foreign and so unreal. David was able to bridge that, both with his knowledge, his ability to listen and to participate. The way that David participated was 2011. I mean, over a decade ago, he was involved with our committee at the, then the Russia Committee, Eurasia Committee now, the American Bar Association, with the Innovation Working Group, talking to people in Skolkova, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Ukraine. I mean, that's so far thinking. And when I came about to write the Russia Corporate Financial and Commercial Law book, it was David who read it more than anybody else. And his comments were invaluable. So much so that in 2018, he joined me when we went to Moscow to share in a Moscow dispute resolution conference where we presented the book and met many people and went to St. Petersburg and overnight train and right back. And David was there for every step of it. So where do you mix in someone who has a great love of adventure, a great concern and love of people and knowledge and openness? If there's one thing that our country, not just Russia and America, but within our own country is people to people, because even here we have significant differences where people are no longer listening. David understood that. He pushed for the Rotary, he pushed for in the committee, pushed for the international, whether we're leadership conferences, his role in the steering committee was invaluable and his co-chair. And I know myself that our committee was so at a loss this year that even the international law section was wondering if we would be able to go forward without members like David. And so it's to honor him that I'm convinced our committee will continue in the efforts for people to people and for Rotary and to bring in as much as that human side that I both value so much and that David embodied. And it's that spirit that I give honor to and I myself am dedicated to continuing. So rather than speak of David, I want to thank him for what he shared and showing me a lot of the way to go. So thank you. Thank you for the spirit 
in Arizona. Thank you, Scott. I would just need to say a few words about David. There's a probably, I hope others are experiencing the same thing I am. There's a, a lot of different touch points, but it's the same guy you keep hearing about in every one of these stories. It's exactly the same person. And unfortunately, I've been to memorial services before, and it's often the case that one person will talk and say, hey, that's really different than the person I knew. Each time I hear somebody say something about David, it sounds like exactly the guy. That I knew exactly the guy I knew. Uh, Rich is going to talk a little bit about, I think, a, a somewhat more recent incarnation of that same person, this time as it touched the, the Carter School and eventually Rotary. Thank you, Larry. Uh, and thank you all for being here. And I want to welcome you also on behalf of the Carter School on uh, Two Point of View, which is our conference center, our meeting center. Um, uh, a property that was uh, bequeathed to us by a wonderful couple, uh, Ed and Helen Lynch, uh, who lived here. I used to come out here with my children and and uh, and enjoy the scenery and see El Helen and Ed when they lived here. At any rate, I'm very glad to see you all, uh, despite the sadness of the occasion. It's also in some ways a joyful occasion. And I want to mention how I'm involved uh, with that, especially on the joyful side. I did some uh, research uh, uh, quickly before coming here uh, because I'm, I'm just questioning myself. When did David and I first start talking? And about what? And so I went into my email and discovered that our first uh, correspondence was in January. 2017, um, and it was about Russia, of course. Uh, I had written some, some things in my capacity as a professor at the Carter School, but also as a, a citizen about Russia and U.S. relations and the way they were deteriorating, and David picked it up and um, got back to me about it. It started... Uh, a correspondence which actually got out of hand. <laughs> um, I think in my email record there are 400, about 450 emails. Uh, and that's not counting the phone calls. Um, I noticed that in my own responses to some of the, well, anyway, David and I talked about lots of things, um, um, focusing in particular on Russia. But I'm also broadening to include the, the, the difficulties that our country was facing in, in maintaining good relations with, uh, with other countries around the world. This was in 2017, I was thinking about uh, a, trying to put together a conference in Malta of uh, Russian, European, and American. Um, representatives to talk about the decline, the declining relationship of the U.S. and Russia, which was even clear at that point, and which David was tremendously concerned about and enormously knowledgeable about, and he helped me put together that conference and we was unable to attend himself, um, which we had in in, in Malta. Um, in 2019, the tenor of the conversations changed because David had become deeply involved in Rotary and had cooked up this idea, really just came from him and perhaps from Mary too, I'm sure from their discussions, um, of the possibility of a collaboration between the Carter School and Rotary as being a step in the direction of trying to improve U.S. Uh, relations with other with Russia and other countries, including China. Um, and so what can I say? I noticed that in some of my responses to David, I'm saying things like, I apologize for being short, short-tempered with <laughs> you. <laughs> because David, if you know him, you know that he was absolutely relentless. Uh, when it came to pressing the causes that he felt deeply about. Um, and not only relentless, but creatively relentless, if I could put it that way, 
because he had a passion for connecting people with each other and connecting organizations um, with each other. Um, what David and I discovered in our all too brief uh, relationship, four and a half years relationship, um, was that uh, being uh, for peace uh, is not a walk in the park. Uh, trying to do something about it uh, involves struggle. And he understood that in a sense, I, I think instinctively, uh, even though he was personally able to relate uh, happily, lovingly even, to all sorts of people and all sorts of cultures, he understood uh, that the forces mobilized to prevent relations from improving were also very strong. Uh, that there are people um, making a lot of hay in terms of political power and making a lot of money from keeping relations from getting better. And so he was tough when it came to, he was a realist when it came to dealing with the realities of power. When I, one of the things I most appreciated about him um, was, and what in, in many ways I think made him a kind of a natural peace builder, uh, was his independence of mind. He would not take at face value the propaganda of any, uh, any parties in power, whether foreign or domestic. He had an ability to distinguish between regimes and peoples. Um, he, I don't think he was a great fan of uh, Mr. Putin, but he was a great fan of the Russian people. And he was a complex man who was able, for example, to recognize that the invasion of Ukraine was something that should not have taken place, but also to recognize that it was not unprovoked, that it was part of a complex, long-lasting conflict, which the U.S. and other parties from time to time were in a position uh, to resolve, but didn't resolve. So David understood if we were going to try to do something about conflicts like Ukraine, he, we, he and I and people like you and, and, and citizens of our country and citizens of other countries were going to have to take matters into their own hands and press for peace. And it was going to not be easy at all. But he had a taste for that kind of struggle. The same kind of relentlessness which made him fun and sometimes annoying uh, <laughs> to deal with. Also made him a, an effective force for peace. One of the most effective forces for peace I know. And as a result of his work, things changed. David was not one to, to talk the talk without walking the walk. He always tried to make action follow words. And I, I think it was a great inspiration to, to me and my colleagues and my students, many of whom we met, because of his determination to follow um, principle with practice. So that's why we miss him. Um, and that's why we're going to keep working uh, in the way that he, I think he would have wanted us to work. Uh, his plans, uh, which are being brought to fruition uh, by Mary and others to create a relationship between the Carter School and Rotary, I think we, this is going to happen um, in one form or another. And, 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 and I think it's going to make a difference in the world uh, if it does happen. So, David, thank you. And thank you for being here. Al Jubitz, there you are. Al Jubitz is going to, I think, probably continue a little bit on this theme of Rotary, but certainly on this theme of peace, in that Al and David knew each other through the Rotary Action Group for Peace. Uh, and also through their joint efforts to try and bring Rotary 
and this larger peace community together in a way that not only was meaningful to Rotarians, but made a difference for the world. Al? Uh, thank you, Larry. Uh, David came into my life late in his and mine. We came together in the interest of advancing peace. His past and his interest in international relations and nonviolent conflict resolution became the glue. He also found Rotary this way. Rotary's deep history of peace building was a natural for David, and he became a Rotarian. And he brought Mary with him, a rock star internationalist in her own right. When David's Rotary life was shortened by his untimely passing, his vision was not. Soon after finding Rotary, he found the Rotary Action Group for Peace, an independent, interest-based, focused organization created a decade ago in support of Rotary's peace area of focus. Soon he became a board member, and shortly thereafter, we heard about his specific interest in inter-country inter committees, another Rotary innovation fostering friendships across borders. His favorite ICC was, of course, as you've heard, USA, Russia. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, I imagine the cross-border friendships he built over time remained strong and led to honest conversations as to post-hostility possibilities. To de describe David's style would be to include words like tenacious, and I've heard some other good ones. <laughs> <laughs> in, in this memorial. Uh, yes, tenacious, uh, helpful, absolutely positive, uh, uniting through connecting people, that's David, uh, utilizing great follow-up and keeping his eye on the ball, and yes, writing long emails. I was so impressed uh, by not only his current activities within Rotary and the Action Group and beyond, and uh, by his frequently articulated vision for more and better peace building. That I made a point to come down to Washington from Boston while visiting family on the East Coast. I wanted to meet this man. And Mary, as you recall, I insisted you be present because something told me here was a perfect example of the quote, behind every great man, close quote, syndrome. So I was thrilled to have time with David and Mary together. And yes, David was aware of his diagnosis. So to me, I wanted to engage and hear firsthand their vision. I was not disappointed. And before leaving, I assured both that I shared their vision and would work toward that no matter what. David, a matter of fact, trained lawyer, never shied away from reality. He knew he wouldn't live forever and wanted to leave a legacy through a marriage. He already had Mary on his side, so that marriage was solid. The other involved two highly respected institutions, namely Rotary International and the Carter School at George Mason. And David and Mary's approach to the dating game was to put some capital on the table to encourage a serious conversation process between two play key players from both institutions. And as Rich uh, referred to, a series of at least, at least uh, three meetings would occur as a feasibility process. We have concluded two of the three meetings and no one has suggested breaking off the dating game. Uh, David with Mary at his side throughout attended the first two day meeting in a weak condition of body but not of mind. This commitment to peace on the planet was motivating to everyone who was present and reminds us all that we create our own future by working together and we have a chance to creating it better. Thank you, Mary, for your support of the dream and for David for imagining a world that works for everyone. <clears throat> Some afterthoughts on David. Each of us on this call were impacted by him. Not in exactly the same way, but in a way that caused you to be here today out of respect. We similarly will impact others in ways different and unknown. This ripple effect is profound over time. 
I have been blessed in my piecework to know several Davids, and I thank them all for their contributions to my understanding and motivation. It is comforting for me to know that if I succeed in some small way to emulate David's style, then the golden thread of life and harmony on this planet will move forward. His example demands our attention. I miss you, David Fishman. Was the president of the Washington Rotary Club that David affiliated with and an important piece of this whole conversation? Uh, thank you, Larry. Pleasure to be here, Larry. Thank you for making this happen. Yes, uh, you uh, got to know this guy, David Fishman, who started coming to our rotary meetings on a regular basis, even though he was a member of the Alexandria Club. And uh, there was something he saw in our club that I think embraced his spirit and what he wanted to do. And uh, as a humble servant and for a fellow Rotarian, said, maybe I can help make this happen. And uh, he actually uh, did come and join our club in July of 2021. And we formed what we called a work, it was a working group that we called the International Peace Initiative. And uh, he had a vision. Uh, he wanted to challenge us Rotarians to do more in terms of peace building. And I think, you know, just in short <coughs> version, I put it that way. He saw the potential of Rotary and uh, 1.4 million Rotarians around the world as a group, kind of a unique group, truly, uh, who could do more in terms of peace building. And uh, I accepted that challenge and I said, let's do it. We, we convened, really, he convened. Uh, I was always trying to keep up with David. <laughs> and I was pressing the thought, you're doing a lot of things, but I consider the most important thing that I did was opening the space. And David ran with the ball. And with all his vision and determination, uh, moved it forward to where we are today. And uh, we have actually our club has a large local group that we call the Decent Peace Initiative, which is just kind of a byproduct. But uh, what is being done with the Carter School, I think, uh, has great potential. And uh, I hope to play a role with the incubator part. Uh, that was one of the outcomes of the point of view uh, second meeting. But I just wanted to touch on a few things, uh, including uh, what Rich was talking about, you were talking about. Uh, emails. I went back. I said <laughs> we checked out the emails. Um, I tally over 500 emails. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, uh, yes, even somewhat before I became president. And he always uh, addressed me as, uh, you know, President Bill, President Bill, this President Bill. And I felt, well, I've got to keep my end of the bargain here. <laughs> and uh, really empower David as much as possible. But David was already a Rotarian. He was already a consummate peace builder. And uh, I think we have succeeded in uh, realizing the potential of Rotary. And I'm very hopeful that we will create replicatable Logic models, templates that we Rotarians can do. And we talk about scaling up things. Um, I think this is the way that the peace building can be scaled up is by having replicatable peace building projects, conflict resolution projects that Rotarians around the world uh, can do. Um, at the end of my term as president, I had 
the pleasure of naming David new Rotarian, new member of the year. He had joined the club at the very beginning of my term. So this photo is with the plaque that uh, was something obviously that David cherished. And uh, he certainly deserved that recognition. He did something truly amazing. I'm a great admirer of his determination. I'm a better person for having done David. So this uh, very, uh, he was very special. We all missed him. And it's just wonderful to be here. It's so grateful. Concludes the formal part of the, the presentations. Then I would like to give a moment if there's anyone who didn't have a chance to speak and wants to say a word, no one should feel obliged. Yeah. Greetings. Greetings, y'all. Uh, my name is Howard Bender. I'm a friend of David and Mary's for some time. And I just want to uh, point out from a clinical perspective the similarity between David and Mary. That they are so caring to everybody that you have friends. When you're David's, when you're David's friend, or when you're Mary's friend, they really look at you and and see what it is that's special to you. Uh, in my case, David knows I like to play tennis with my darling bride, little Susan, and he gave me his tie, which had tennis racket on it. I had never seen one. It just was out of the blue. He says, here's the time. Uh, but the most important thing, and the last thing I'm going to say about David, is uh, we were on a hiking group, one day hiking group, five miles from us. I'm a terrible hiker. And there were about 20 people uh, in the group, all friends of David and all friends of each other. Uh, but I'm a terrible hiker. I was very bad just trying to struggle to keep up. And everybody else was forward, and David saw that and came back and stayed with him. So here he was, a fine hacker himself, going slowly, very slowly, just to be with me, so I would have somebody uh, to be with. So that's all I have to say. Thanks. John Greenwald, I understand you have some words you'd like to share. Yes, thank you very much for this opportunity to, to be a part of this wonderful occasion. I uh, knew David for a shorter time than almost all of you who have spoken, and I knew him, uh, knew the comprehensive man, obviously, less well than, than most of you. I met him only a few years ago in connection with another organization that I think hasn't been mentioned, that is J Street. Uh, we were on a couple of advocacy meetings on Capitol Hill talking to uh, members of the House uh, representation from Virginia and our two senators uh, talking about uh, the peace resolution problems in the Middle East. And uh, we formed a, a certain bond over the next couple of years. Uh, we met for at least a couple of lunches. But uh, primarily, it was a small number of those emails that people have referred to. But in particular, it was telephone conversations that very often came when I was uh, making my daily walks. Uh, I'm afraid not in such lovely locations as those that Mary has shown us pictures of just around the neighborhood here in uh, in McLean. But I was always very happy when uh, the the detective story or the espionage novel that I was listening to in my AirPods uh, had a break in from Siri who said, you have a call from David Fishman, because we then uh, had a good long talk about our common passion, which was a peaceful settlement of disputes. And in my case, I think David uh, wanted to talk to me because that was my career. I'd spent 30 years in the foreign service much of it in Eastern Europe, unfortunately, never in, in the Soviet Union or Russia, and then many years at the International Crisis Group, and then more recently uh, with, with J Street. Uh, but I I recognized in him a passion for what had always been a lifelong passion of mine, which was peaceful settlement of disputes. 
And we talked about Russia, we talked about Russia, Ukraine, we talked about Israel, Palestine, we talked about uh, India, Pakistan, we talked about Iran. And uh, I, I always realized that I was a, a disappointment to him because uh, we weren't able to find a way in which I can make a real operational contribution to, to those things that he had great passion for, uh, partly because I, I know nothing about or knew nothing about Rotary. David uh, taught me a fair amount over the last couple of years, but it wasn't an organization I knew, so I, I didn't see easily how I could make a, a contribution, but he told me about what he was doing, and I thought it was a great idea, and I'm thrilled to know that, uh, in fact, he's made provision, and Mary, you've made provision so that the idea of peace development, uh, cooperation between Rotary and the Carter School, which I know only by reputation is one of the great institutions in the country, established by a, a very great uh, uh, a man who is probably the greatest of our former presidents with his passion for peaceful settlement of disputes. So. Uh, again, thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. I, I feel I lost a very good friend, even though a friend of a short time. And uh, it's it's an honor to be able to know that uh, the field that I'm most interested in is one that a great person like David was so deeply interested in and has made a lifelong and now a post-life contribution to. Thank you again for letting me be a part of this. Thank you. Barbara, what are you? Hello, I'm Barbara Mueller. I think I'm next. I'm um, chair of the Rotary Action Group for Peace and had the honor of having David on our board, the same Rotary Action Group that Al Jubitz mentioned. Do you realize his contribution will live forever because of the way he spoke and the recordings that we have? I also have the opportunity to interview him on my peacepodcast.org. Imagine asking David in the last months of his life, what is it you want to leave to us? What is it you want me to remember on the Rotary Action Group for Peace? Here's his words. We all care deeply about our future. And now is the time to solve our global challenges. As he said those words, I said to him, well, what are we gonna harness? What can we harness to bring this dream of yours into reality? And he said, we can harness the 44,000 Rotary Clubs that can work with the Rotary Action Group for Peace and cover the millions of members of all those Rotary Clubs around the world. And he even quoted Secretary General, Unite, uh, he believed firmly in the United Nations as my late husband, Robert Mueller, who was Assistant Secretary General said, we are the power, the people are the power. And so he said, what about what Antonio Guterres said? We need an avalanche of action to in every corner of the world. So here's his final words on my podcast. He's number 88 and one of the most frequently watched peacepodcast.org. If you want to go and hear David's words, you will love everything he said. Just go to peacepodcast.org and get number 88. Here's what he says. Imagine a world where Rotary leads the way to permanent peace. David asks and answers the question, what is the purpose? I said to him, of your donation, a quarter of a million dollars? And he said, oh, my wife and I plan to make that to RI. My hope is that this donation will strengthen the relationship between Rotary and the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution and lead the way to many global collaborations to become a global peace building force, a global peace building force. And Rotary starts to think of themselves, not as Rotary, but as a global peace building force. Impossible? Nope. Just listen to David and you will find how we can all become 
the action to accomplish this goal. Since David has passed, Helen Peacock on my board, myself and Al and several others have put together something called Ending War 101. And we dedicated it to David because we know that was his dream. The global conflicts begin when we end. Global conflicts are part of the problem and they can end when we end war. So Ending War 101 is our dream for Rotary, Rotary Action Group for Peace. And David, I want you to know this. Your dream for peace is working now. It's in the hearts and our DNA. And I love you for what you give me on that peace podcast. And Al Jubitz is now in Australia. He's in Melbourne working hard to get the Rotary members who are there right now to bring peace into its proper position on our planet in our lifetime. I always said that to my husband who passed in 2010. Sweetheart, I'm going to miss you, but I'm going to carry on your work and I will work till the day I die to bring peace to our planet. And David, that's what you wanted. And we're all here to carry your dream into its full potential. And God bless each of you. I have listened to your words and I love all of you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Barbara. Um, my name is Lally Van Heston. And I guess I got to really know David and very looking at the things with all his dips. <laughs> I mean, I think of David, the dip, but also the yellow banana. Because he would come, I have a swimming pool, I live in Falls Church, I have a swimming pool in my backyard. <laughs> and, you know, I, at some time, I think David learned that I had a swimming pool. And he would come and drive his yellow car around, and sometimes I'd be even walking home or I come home from someplace else, and here would be the yellow car out there, and I know he'd be back in my swimming pool. <laughs> and he'd get in the pool, and he would jump in, put his clothes on, and then he'd get out of the pool, and he'd sit down and dry off, and he'd start working on his briefs with the Rotary Club and things as a lawyer, and he was working with the starting over. Okay, everybody goes to line and think of David with all his clothes on. And and yeah, I have to say something though, because I have to finish saying something. I would go out there feeling that I had to go and at least say something to him. I really wanted to come home and just sit by the pool by myself. <laughs> but I thought David was enjoying himself and I would go out there and just say hello, and I would. And then we start talking. And the next thing I know is the two of us, I come down my stairway and he'd come over near me and we'd start talking for like an hour. Mm -hmm. about all the stuff he was doing in Rotary and local, you know, I mean, all the local stuff with the local politics he was involved in. And that was some of the most momentous. I mean, I think back on it. It was funny. The yellow banana. And there he is swimming in my pool with all this bone time. But that was the start of a wonderful friendship. And, <laughs> funny to that, isn't it? <laughs> and I know about, I, I mean, I know he used to come out and go into your, you know, and your I was close with my pond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And all the wonderful conversations we had, and how much I learned about the world. And I hope I also, we argued a lot about politics. <laughs> <laughs> it was great fun. He was a wonderful person there. And I like many people. So thank you so much. For Hi, my name is Barbara Williams, and this is my husband, Tom. And we have known uh, David and Mary for many years. And one tradition that we had pre-pandemic was our Christmas Eve dinners. <laughs> and uh, although David was Jewish, and Marsha that had to leave early was always there as Jewish, they loved Christmas Eve. I always had a big tree, and um, we exchanged little gifts. And David and Mary would always come late because Mary was working on her salad. <laughs> anyway, we exchanged these little gifts. And um, 
had a lot of good wine, a lot of good food, a lot of good conversation, and I'm sure politics came up more than once. Uh, my husband, Tom, is a staunch conservative, and uh, he always impressed all this for local <laughs> But um, anyway, um, one thing I remember we on these little gifts, uh, it was so easy to get something for David because anything with a duck or anything that went <laughs> quack was one of <laughs> the presents I always picked out, right? Or chocolate, right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we will miss him very much. Okay, I'm gonna take one or two more and we're gonna bring it to a close. Hi, I'm Rudy Deister, and I'm speaking not only for myself, but I'm speaking for another woman in Annandale who owned a pool. That's <laughs> a member, she was a member of the colony until her untimely death last November. Uh, and I've been to Susan's on numerous occasions when David would be sitting by her pool, breathing, drying off. And I know he and Susan were very good friends, and Susan would certainly want to remember David. And my memories of David were similar to everyone here. Um, I got to know David's true kindness and his love of people later in his life, but he was truly a very gracious and very sensitive and very giving. Thank you. <laughs> Is everyone going to be upset if we stop? Is there somebody who's dying? In? Okay. The, so if somebody had landed here from, from Mars, never having met David Fishman, and just sat here for the last 90 minutes, they would know David Fishman. <laughs> they would know David Fishman, at least in my opinion. I mean, that was as clear and as full a presentation of a, of a life well lived as I can imagine having taken place in, in 90 minutes. And I think Mary did a beautiful job of assembling voices to, to do exactly that. Uh, but really, the voice that's kind of echoing in the room is David's. If the people would talk about him, I, I mean, I, I'm not the one closest to him. Many of you are closer than I, but I'm telling you, he was sitting on my shoulder through that, that whole presentation. So I don't know where, where we all go when it's all done, but I sort of hope he was watching this. So thank you all very much. How about a standing ovation for David? <laughs> <laughs>